Live Fit Podcast, episode 117, Gut Health with Wade Lightheart. Health is not a guarantee or a certainty. And I also discovered that, no disrespect to the medical industry, is like when, you know, I'd watch her go through the treatments, it seemed like I, I didn't understand how these treatments were trying to make her healthier. I mean, they were obviously, you know, treating the disease and treating those things. And I thought there's, there's something not right here. And I don't, and I don't know what it is. And not being sophisticated at the time, I decided to embark upon a mission to figure out what that was about. And in all live organisms, people, plants, fish, whatever, you have enzymes. And enzymes are responsible for everything from thinking to blinking. Now, what's interesting about humans is that we've invented this wonderful thing called cooking and this other thing called processing and we've also in, in, invented preservatives, <laughs> is that we're eating an enzyme-deficient diet. Anytime you cook anything to 114 degrees, there's no enzymes present in it. And what that means is that your body has to produce its own digestive enzyme. Welcome to the Live Fit Podcast with Glenn Johnson, your resource for all things that contribute to good health. You will hear expert advice and interviews with leading authorities on fitness, food, fat loss, mindset, and the mind-body connection. You will find show notes, articles, and health programs at livefitpodcast.com. Ah, uh, yes. It is time once again for the Live Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Johnson, your guide to better health. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Today's guest is going to share with us his vast education and experience at strengthening the body from the inside out. Wade Lightheart is a three-time all-natural national bodybuilding champion. He's an advisor to the American Anti-Cancer Institute and director of education at Bioptimizers Nutrition. He's also the author of several books, including the best-selling Staying Alive in a Toxic World and The Wealthy Backpacker. As host of the Awesome Health Podcast, Wade's mission is to help others fix their digestion and transform their health with daily practices of positive principles, rituals, and optimizers. Let's hear what Wade has to say about how you can strengthen your body from the inside out. Hi, Wade. How are you doing today? Oh, doing awesome, Glenn. Great to be here. Oh, that's, that's good to hear. Awesome is a wonderful way to start the day. I gave a little brief introduction about you, but maybe you can fill in the gaps and just tell us how you got to be where you are now, why you're doing what you're doing, that sort of thing. Great uh, question. It's a, I'll try and make a long story short, uh, you know, because I've been doing this a long time. But basically, uh, like everyone else, I grew up as a kid in North America, in northern Canada, so uh, playing hockey and all that sort of stuff. And then when I was 15 years old, a couple of really powerful events occurred to me. Number one, um, of course, living in a very rural community, it was five miles to my nearest neighbor living in the middle of the woods. So it was so pretty, where, pretty remote. Where in Canada were you? Uh, it was a place called uh, New Brunswick, Canada. And I lived at a place, <laughs> as boringly as this could be, Square Lake, New Brunswick. <laughs> my wife is from Moncton. Oh, wow. That's amazing. My parents still live down there. That's that's unbelievable. Square Lake. Wow. Is the lake yeah. actually square? It, the lake is actually square, and it was a beautiful resort. My parents were caretakers of it. and uh, But as a 15-year-old, that was not a great idea. I didn't like that we had moved there because uh, you know I was away from my friends. I had to spend a lot of time myself. But uh, concordant to that, my sister gave me a bodybuilding magazine, and uh, I decided that uh, I wanted to get these muscles. And so I built a, a uh, literally I built my first gym in the barn uh, nice. that I was at, yeah, and started training kind of Rocky style when you know Rocky Four or whatever it was when he fought <laughs> Drago, and started training like you know in the cold. I was training my snowmobile suit and things like that. But the other big thing that and this really had a strong impact. At the same time, my sister was diagnosed with cancer, and over the next four years, as I was uh, building my body up. Um, hers was breaking down as she went through the medical model before she died uh, at the young age of 22. She was an older sister for me. And what that did is it set me up for uh, a lot of things in my life. It was, you know, obviously it's a traumatic experience and I got to witness um, the, the, the liabilities of the medical industry. But what I got clear about is that health is not a guarantee or a certainty. 
And I also discovered that and no disrespect to the medical industry is like when, you know, I'd watch her go through the treatments. It, it seemed like I, I didn't understand how these treatments were trying to make her healthier. I mean, they were obviously, you know, treating the disease and treating those things. And I thought there's, there's something not right here. And I don't and I don't know what it is. And not being sophisticated at the time, I decided to embark upon a mission to figure out what that was about. And I enrolled in the University of New Brunswick and studied exercise physiology and nutrition. And uh, that didn't that didn't give me the answers I was looking for. It was like a, a mismatch of information, but there was no there was no grand theory or message or principles or applications that could do that. And so what I started doing is I started seeking out mentors and finding people who were producing the result that I wanted. And at the time, I thought that building up your body had a lot to do with uh, athletic fitness. And so I became a over the years became a successful personal trainer and uh, was a competitive bodybuilding athlete and went on to the highest levels, won a bunch of national championships and went to the Mr. Universe contest, uh, had a great coach. And what was interesting is in 2003, when I went to my first Mr. Universe contest, now keep in mind, I've been training and practicing for 16 years, studying with all these people, wow, running yeah. my own nutrition business. I've got the best training, got Spartan discipline. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do. Well, after that contest, in 2003, I gained 42 pounds of fat and water in 11 weeks. No way. Yeah, yeah. So it was terrible. So I went from Mr. Universe, literally competition, to Mr. Marshmallow. And I was like, in how, how long? Was... In how long a time? In 11 weeks. Wow, you were really on a mission to to kind of eat all the foods you hadn't eaten in the past 16 years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, well, it was there was a deeper thing going on and. The excessiveness or the focus and discipline that led me to a high performance situation, like a performance based lifestyle. So, because I was basing um, my health on the quality of fitness, body fat percentage, VO2, and then the externals of physical perfection, right? That that's, you know, right. if you look that way, we assume that people are healthy or right. they're strong, but they're not, they're fit relative to the sport that they're doing. So football fit is different than bodybuilding fit, which is different than figure skating fit. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people make the same mistake that I do is they assume if somebody looks good that they're fit and they're healthy. And I made that mistake. And, and fortunately, I met a doctor. And this doctor was this, you know, he was a senior citizen at the time. He was radiant, vibrant. He had so much energy. I, I never really met anybody like this guy. And I said, you know, doctor, what? What happened? Like, how does this possible? How did I lose my health so, so severely in the pursuit of this outward goal? And he says, Wade, you've learned how to build the body from the outside in, but you haven't learned to build the body from the inside out. Wow. Yeah. And that was, it just hit me like a ton of bricks because I had spent so much time and effort looking at these external cues and the, and the traditional measures of fitness and cells, but none of those were going to lead me to health. And of course, he had a track record of rebuilding some of from people from all sorts of, you know, extreme illnesses, you know, like really serious life-threatening conditions. And he followed a protocol by starting people off um, reconditioning their digestive system. And I said, well, that's great. So. Obviously, that's what's wrong with me. I've done all these eating all these proteins and eat all these things and da, 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 da. So bottom line, I followed his program and uh, it cost me a lot of money. <laughs> I'll tell people that right now. I think it was about 1500 bucks a month and I went on a completely raw food diet and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and it worked and I rebuilt myself. Nice. Uh, and six months later, uh, I had my physique back. But more importantly, I had my health back and I started teaching this. And that led to, uh, you know, a couple books and a speaking career and then an online platform. And four years later, I, I, I had coached uh, over 10,000 people worldwide uh, through an online platform. Um, in the And then from that, I gathered a lot of data. And from that data, I started to learn what were the things that worked for people? What were the things that um, were essential? What were the places or the blind spots that people were missing in their protocol? Why some people responded to different diets and not other diets or different exercise programs and all this sort of stuff? And what was going on internally for people? And at that point, I made a comeback. I went to the world championships again. Uh, I only ate 85 grams of protein a day, which is unusual. I only was on a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. People were shocked. So I did everything that the world said in the external world that you couldn't do. 
uh, as a competitive athlete, did better in the competitions, felt better, didn't have the blow up. And at that point, I said, you know what? I'm excited about this. Uh, I'm going to take it to the world. And I created what I call the awesome health system. And I apply that system and share it with everybody and anybody who wants to learn what are the internal principles, practices, and procedures that you can use in order to really experience that that kind of dreamed for health and vitality. That's fantastic. And, you know, you said you were only taking in 85 grams of protein a day, which is actually how much you should be. I don't know what your weight is, but it's supposed to be roughly uh, one gram per kilogram of body weight. And uh, and so if you were 85 kilograms, that's going to put you at like around 190 pounds, 195 pounds, I believe. Yeah. So uh, when I uh... – Usually I walk around between one one ninety and two oh five, depending on at a height of five eight. So I carry a lot of muscle mass. Mm -hmm. um, when I was com competing, I would get down to about uh, the eighty kilo, one hundred seventy six pound class. But you're really weighing about eighty five on stage, one eighty five on stage because you kind of dehydrate. I don't recommend people follow bodybuilding procedures. By the way, it's not a really right. healthy sport. No, but, no. I learned a lot. I, you learn a lot from that, and there are certain things that I did apply. Now, keep in mind, in 2003, I was eating 250 grams of protein a day, which is common in the athletic and the performance world. Right. What's also common in the athletic performance world is people are done by 35. Ah. They can't recover. They start running into injuries, arthritic conditions, uh, all sorts of different things. And what's interesting is even though now I'm in my mid-40s, um, I'm stronger than I was in my 30s, and I feel better than I did in my 30s. So That's it's fantastic. amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, obviously, I still don't, I don't look exactly the same as I did in my 30s or my <laughs> 20s. But I feel great, and I feel healthy, and I feel vibrant, and I have lots of energy. And I, you know, I travel all over the world. I have an extensive schedule. And uh I just feel really, really lucky, and I want to share this with so many people because it, you know, I, I made some critical mistakes, and uh, I got lucky that I found someone that helped me, and so I want to pay that forward to everybody that I can to start spreading that message about uh, where people can make, uh, where people might make mistakes or what they can do if they're running into trouble now. Well, you know, age is is not just a visual appearance from a photograph. It has a lot to do with the way a person moves and how they speak and their attitude. If you look from a distance at a human walking, you can generally get an idea, and I don't mean a great distance, but, you know, 100 yards, let's say. You can generally get an idea of approximately their age. Are they 13? Are they 18? Are they 50? <laughs> you can tell by their kinetics how they're moving because older people generally move more stiff and uh, they don't have any extra motions where a 13 year old bo bounces and bobs all around and even if this 13 year old is the same height as a 18 year old if they're you know fairly tall so it's not just the size thing it's it's their movement so if you are moving with extra kinetic energy and people might think you're younger than you actually are and being 40, you could easily pull off 30 just by your your attitude, your personality, and your energy level. Absolutely. Movement patterns are a, a fun study all in their own. And uh, I think uh, it, it's fascinating now because the movement patterns and body postures of, of the population are radically changing due to uh, technology, which is making many of us just sit at desks and live a, a more sedentary lifestyle than our, you know, our ancestors. And it's uh, it's fascinating how that you're, we're seeing the texting neck and, you know, <laughs> all these sort of things or people are rotated forward and hunched forward and stuff because of uh, technology. You know, I have that problem uh, for two reasons. One is I do spend a fair amount of time on a computer, though I'm very aware of my posture and I do what I can to fight that forward curve. But I also have thousands of hours on a bicycle that have caused that uh, upper thoracic uh, forward curve. So that those are two reasons I, I, I fight it. So I'm constantly working on my back muscles to tighten them up, to strengthen them up, to help hold myself upright. And there is, of course, that awareness that needs to, to take place. Absolutely. You know, and, it's, it, and that's really the key. I think awareness is the start of everything. Once you become aware of something, then you can take actions to, uh, you know, correct 
whatever the liability in one's life because no one lives a perfect lifestyle. No one has the the optimal place uh, or, you know, posture situation or lifestyle or dietary habits or all that sort of stuff. That's very difficult. But it's how do you manage the life that you have in a way that uh, you can actually live with? Exactly. Exactly. Uh, as an example, I have a, stit, a sit stand desk and I spend most of my time standing, but it's important not to stand in one place either because that's just as bad for you as sitting. So I will kind of move around and I'll lift my legs and I'll march and I will do squats and I have all kinds of little exercise equipment around my desk. I have dumbbells. When I'm not needing my hands, I'll raise the dumbbells or I have this little balance ball, kind of like a miniature BOSU, and I'll stand on that with one leg and do one-legged squats or, you know, you know, like airplane, a yoga move called air position called the airplane, that sort of thing. And, you know, I do what I can. I can do these things while on the phone, so it's not really interfering with my productivity. And I think a lot of people just don't think about it. They're not aware of the things they could be doing with their body while they're working. You make it bring up a good point because I think if you watch children, um, they're fascinating creatures to watch movement wise and how vigorous and creative and how robust their movement patterns are actually actually are. And um, I, I think it's it, it's a good study just to watch, <laughs> to, oh, yeah. to watch and, and, and interact. And if you get to spend time around younger people, uh, it can be very invigorating. You know, I was just hanging out with the one of my one of my little friends as i call him and uh you know we're rolling around on the ground and we're having fun and you know i'm doing all these movement patterns that i don't normally do and then i get up and i i feel different i feel energized from that process isn't that neat yeah really it's really fascinating uh there seems to be an innate intelligence that we uh, we lose in the modern world well, I was just going to throw a challenge out to our uh, adult listeners, any especially older adult listeners. If you're if you're 30 or above, I'll call I'll put that at older. I I challenge you to move like a like a kid, move like a 12 year old or a 10 year old. Watch watch a a child move and try to move like them. Try to pretend you're an actor. Remember that movie 13 going on 30 with Jennifer. Ah, I'm missing her last name, but she had to act like a 13 year old even though she's a full-grown adult and she pulled it off pretty well she had the the speaking pattern and the physic the physicality of that and I would challenge you to do that at least with your movement just so you can get a better awareness of how you're moving absolutely so tell us what you really gleaned from your 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 time with the doctor who who worked on your gut health what can you share with us that that people here can can really sink their teeth into and and maybe you know shift some of their their eating patterns? I, I will, and let me give you a, a little bit of statistics to warm people up to to how serious this is. Um, gastrointestinal diseases, which is your know, digestive system, account for it's the fifth leading cause of death. And if you look at the major causes, you know, cancer, heart disease, diabetes, these type of things. Um, there also can be traced to dietary imbalances or nutritional deficiencies or toxicity um, that have you know contributed over a long term. And these things don't develop overnight. They don't develop in a year or two years. They develop over 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And what he had demonstrated, and I'm going to go back in time. So stay with me here as I'm going to give you, a, I'm going to throw a lot of things and a lot of noodles on the wall here. Okay. But there is, there is a book. Uh, and he, by the way, he had rebuilt him, his, his own life from, he had uh, cirrhosis of the liver and he also had the colon cancer and he used this technology to kind of rebuild himself. What's his name? Uh, his name was Dr. Michael O'Brien and um, fascinating individual. And so what he discovered was a book written by uh, Dr. Edward Howe called Enzyme Nutrition, and he, uh, Dr. Howe also wrote a book called uh, Food Enzymes for Health and Longevity, and these were buried in the Harvard Medical Labs, and uh, they, were, they were eventually brought forth. A couple people found them and looked at this information, and what Dr. Howe had discovered is that he had put uh, all these different experiments on various animals that ate – an enzyme deficient diet. And I'll get to that in a minute. 
And what he found is that by second and third – by third generation, they had uh, problems with fertility. They had strange social behaviors. Um, they they didn't function well. They weren't able to eat properly, and they started developing all sorts of diseases. Now, what is an enzyme diet? If you look at animals, if you look at uh, whether it's tigers eating zebras or cows eating grass, every animal on this planet eats its food in a live state. It's in other words, it's raw and it's and it's and it's live. In all live organisms, people, plants, fish, whatever, you have enzymes. And enzymes are responsible for everything from thinking to blinking. In the human body, they've developed – they've found over 25,000 different enzymatic pathways inside the body. So every – you know, to think requires an enzyme. To digest your food requires an enzyme. To do any function, any chemical reaction in your body requires an enzyme. And an enzyme, what it does is it accelerates chemical – uh, transactions inside the body. Food companies use enzymes to accelerate or uh, make changes in the company. Chemical companies use enzymes to, you know, change one product to another product. So enzymes are very power ca powerful catalysts. Now, what's interesting about humans is that we've invented this wonderful thing called cooking and this other thing called processing. And we've also in, in, invented preservatives. <laughs> and these things are awesome for um, storing and preserving and increasing calories in humans. And it, we've done a great job of that. And we've uh, had an abundance of calories, which, you know, I always laugh about. Uh, we talk about these different diets and history, historical diets and stuff. But th for most of history, getting enough food was a problem or getting enough nutrients was a problem. Now we are, oh, yeah. we're, we're, we're overfed. We have different kind of diseases. But going back here is that we're eating an enzyme deficient diet. Anytime you cook anything to 114 degrees, there's no enzymes present in it. And what that means is that your body has to produce its own digestive enzymes. So if you go to your doctor, he'll say, well, don't worry about it because your body produces those enzymes, which is true. However, I am going to put – I'm going to ask people a question, and that question is, where are the enzymes coming from? Where are we producing it? Now, every physiologist will tell you that digestion – requires the most metabolic energy of just about everything we do. So if it takes a lot of energy in order to create or to digest food, why is that? Well, because our body has to take proteins and convert those into enzymes, and those enzymes digest our food. I'll give you an example. Most people or most listeners have probably had the proverbial Thanksgiving dinner or the Christmas dinner, you know, where we eat – you know, this beautiful meal. Yeah, the family's there. You have, you know, an extra helping of everything. You take another round. Grandma or Ma brings out the apple pie or whatever, and you go, oh, you know what? I'm just going to have a bite with ice cream. And then after, everybody kind of like disperses to the living room, and they're falling on the couch, and some people are laying on the floor, and everybody passes out, and they're drooling, and they wake up an hour later, and they're hungry. <laughs> yeah. We've all, had, we've all experienced that. Now, well, what, what's, what's going on here? How did I just eat all this food and yet I'm tired? Well, the enzymes that are running our brain, the enzymes that are pumping our blood, the enzymes that are doing every other function in the body are now uh, – they're going, wait a second. We need to put all our enzymatic capacity towards digesting this incredibly large meal that we've had. And we'll even break down smooth muscle tissue in the intestinal tract in order to convert that. When we wake up, there's key amino acids that are missing and we go, oh, I'm hungry again. Because I need these amino acids, even though you've had the biggest meal of the year. Now, that's an extreme situation. But we're doing this on a small level on a day-to-day -day basis. And what happens is we build up undigested food in our intestinal tract. This undigested food uh, creates a lot of problems. And over time, it will feed bad bacteria. These will produce toxins that can affect their brain. So we've all woken up with the brain fog. Oh, you, know, you yeah. wake up and you're kind of groggy. Yep. Well, what that is is there's toxins being produced by the bacteria in your body that are causing brain fog. There's undigested – if you look under uh, a live blood cell analysis, you can see when you eat a big protein meal or something like that, you'll see the, the blood cells actually sticking together like glue because they're not separating 
the proteins are in the system and they're not cleaned up. If you look at people who have various diseases, you'll see the oxidative damage on the cells. You'll see food particles. You'll see bacteria cultures uh, floating through the system, viruses, all kinds of interesting things. Crystallization, like arthritic conditions. Uh, you can actually see this in the blood. And so from that, what we know is that undigested food starts getting into the system and causes a variety of problems. And so what you what people have to recognize is they need to, number one, address the enzymatic issues. According to Dr. Edward Howe, the average 40-year-old has less than 30% of the enzymes that they started when they were born. Now, think about that. When you talk about movement patterns, when you talk about energy levels, your enzymatic capacity, the amount of enzymes inside your body determines how many metabolic checks you can write. And when you're a kid, you can write lots of metabolic checks because you have lots of these. But you start to deplete the enzymes by, you know, cooked food, by chemicals in the environment, by antibacterial stuff, by preservatives, by the aging process, uh, excessive heat. Uh, all of these things will start to diminish your enzymatic reserves. And what happens is so, you're – So wait, wait. I have a yeah. question. Do you yeah. mean uh, – the quantity of any one particular enzyme, or do you mean the diversity of enzymes? The diversity. So if you, if we had, let's just pick a number, 30 enzymes when we're born, we as adults might have 20 different enzymes? Well, I would say Just more, to pick a number? I would say we, we're going to be way more than that. We're talking about 25,000 different enzymatic pathways. However... I do categorize those into families like proteolytic enzymes, which digest protein, um, amylase, which digest carbohydrates, lipase, which digest fats, cellulase, which does uh, digest plant matter. And then you have a, a whole range. So, so, for example, people are having problems with uh, gluten right now, gluten free diets or people who have problems with uh, lactose, you know, can't they don't have lactase. Sure. But what we're finding what we're finding is. Um, what was really going on is the body's enzymatic uh, capacity is being diminished and certain foods are going – the body's going, you know what? I can't produce any more enzymes to break that food down. Therefore, we're not going to do it anymore. We, like, it's, it's, I'm going to give you enough warning signals, i.e. pain, suffering, <laughs> to, you know, right. to say, hey, pay attention. Stop doing this when in fact uh, what we found is when we start introducing uh, you know, full-spectrum – uh, particularly proteolytic, uh, strong proteolytic enzymes and with amylase and lipase, those three are the big ones. Um, when we start introducing that into the, into the body or people's diets, what they start to see is a variety of different conditions change. So, and this takes time. It's not, this is not an instant fix. This is not like take a pill and feel better. But what we found is usually within three months, people who are suffering from conditions like depression, and I'm not saying this as a treatment or anything, but a lot of people that might notice they have mood disorders or they have brain fog. Well, oftentimes they're not digesting their proteins and they don't have enough protease in the body. And so what happens is you add protease into that and all of a sudden they say, you know what, I'm not feeling depressed anymore or I feel I can concentrate better or I'm happier often because now they can create or manufacture the polypeptide chains to make your happy hormones in your brain. Same thing as I see people who um, are sensitive to sugars. Uh, diabetics and stuff, well, they'll start using amylase in their diets and all of a sudden they need less insulin. And then people who have skin conditions or hormone imbalances, uh, what we'll find is you add lipase into their diets, which is an enzyme that breaks down fats, and all of a sudden their skin starts to clear up after a little while or they, they, they notice that they're, they got a little bit more pep um, from their hormones. So what we're seeing is that people's ability to extract, to digest and absorb and utilize the nutrients that they are eating from their diet is directly correlated to what Howell determined was the enzyme potential. And so now you walk into store shelves across the world and you see all these different digestive enzymes. And like people right. are going, well, what, what, what's going on here? Like, what, what? you know, and, and the, the downside of that is there is an extremely wide range of products and qualities. And unfortunately, there's some manufacturers that go out there and they take a good idea and they put, you know, a mishmash of maybes in the bottle and sell it because it's the hot item right now. Right. Uh, and then there's you'll see, you know, you'll see a bottle of enzymes for 10 bucks and you'll see a bottle of enzyme for $100 and they look kind of the same. And if you're not a sophisticated person, 
uh, you know, haven't studied this stuff, and ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the population haven't. They're not that strange like myself. They yeah. don't know the difference, and they don't know how to assess that. So that's stage one of digestion. There's two more stages that are relative to people in this age, uh, particularly as you get older. It's really noticeable, and that is um, hydrochloric acid, and the other one is probiotics. So if you want, we can kind of go down the digestive process to explain where where people might be having challenges your listeners might be having challenges absolutely yes please okay so so, so just so here's another statistic i'll throw out there 85 percent of the population has unreported digestive issues usually experiences um acid reflux uh you know bloating gas uh constipation or or diarrhea or things of this disorder um and we've all kind of experienced those things from time to time but left unchecked, uh, these things are indicative of bigger issues. So if we look at digestion, what happens is this. The, uh, I'm going to simplify this process um, for our listeners to understand. Once you understand this, you're going to really comprehend things, and it's going to turn on some light bulbs in people's heads. So I hope they're listening carefully. When you Digestion starts when you first start chewing the food uh, and, and breaking it down into smaller pieces, and you release uh, – you know, pitalin, which is starts breaking down carbohydrates. And the food enters into what's called the upper cardiac portion of the stomach. And it's going to stay there for 30 to 60 minutes. Now, in this stage, the enzymes present in the food start to work on the food. And if there's no enzymes present, this tells your body that I need to start producing enzymes in the liver. And then they're stored, in, you know, uh, and then released in the later part of the stomach. But the pre-digestion doesn't happen, and that's a problem because your major proteins get broken down. There's five major proteins that get broke down in, 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 into amino acids, and people have to understand we don't need protein. We need amino acids, so we need to break our food into amino acids. Mm -hmm. Second thing that happens at 30 to 60 minutes is your body will uh, start producing hydrochloric acid. Now, hydrochloric acid – HCL, you see on a store shelf is HCL. What that does is two things. Number one, it furthers breaks down protein and, and, and cleaves these into amino acids, but it also serves to disinfect their food from any pathogens that we might eat, bacteria, bugs, parasites, all sorts of nasty things that may be present on our food. Once that process is complete and your, your, your stomach is churning and creating a chime and all that sort of stuff, before the – um, the food particles enter into the intestinal tract, your body is going to release what's called bicarbonate buffers, which is just a fancy name for minerals, to buffer this acid so that it doesn't burn your intestinal tract. Now, if you don't have enough hydrochloric acid, and this is really common for people who are 40 and up, what happens is you have these little flaps, they're called sphincters, that don't close properly because they're closed based on the amount of acid inside it. And what happens? You get acid, whatever acid you have produced, starts splash splashing up into the esophagus yeah. and creating acid reflux. So acid reflux isn't too much stomach acid. It's actually too little. Acid reflux heartburn that kind of goes in that category. So what people usually don't recognize is that they're not producing enough. And, of course, then they get on a proton pump which uh, bl blocks the acid, but then further exaggerates the condition of undigested food. And if you look on the medical, if you look at the medical periodicals, or you ask your pharmacist about if you're on a proton pump for di for acid, what it's going to notice, that they say you should only be on these proton pumps for four to six weeks. Yet people are prescribed on these things for years, and that becomes another issue. So the side effects of that plus undigested food. Now, back to the intestinal tract. We're in the intestinal tract. Once that food is entered into there, into there, there is bacteria cultures. And scientists estimate there's approximately 500 bacteria cultures in the average person's intestinal tract. Now, before people get freaked out. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have what? Yeah. It's, we actually have somewhere they, they estimate that we have about 10 times the amount of bacteria in our intestinal tract than we do cells in the body. Crazy, right? Yeah, that's a lot and, of bacteria. And 10% of these are good. 10% of these are bad. And 80% of these are opportunist in a, in a healthy body. So the thing that it, the, the thing that people have to understand is these 10% good bacteria are called probiotics or 
you know, gut flora or things like that. These are these are the guys or girls, I guess, who are digesting our food, the final stage of digestion of our food. They break down essentially. If we didn't have these bacteria in our body, we couldn't eat. We couldn't live. We actually right. need them. It's a symbiotic relationship that we have. And the bad guys, we're always trying to fight. Now, the problem is, and what's interesting is we've solved We've solved one problem and created another. In the last, you know, 70, 80 years now, we had a massive breakthrough in medical technology, and that was the development of antibiotics. And most of us are here today thanks to antibiotics that grandma or, or parents got that saved their life. Because before you got an infection or you got a bacteria infection, stuff, you just died. Yeah. Uh, you, just, you just didn't survive. And if you look at the population explosion on the planet, a lot of that can be traced to antibiotics and medical technology. However, what they didn't anticipate, actually the originators of, of, of um, antibiotics were concerned about this, is anytime you subject a bacteria culture to an excessive environment, it begins to mutate. And now if you go into hospitals around the world today, you will find that, the, that they have what's called bacteria or uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. And this antibiotic-resistant bacteria now becomes a major problem because when you give it antibiotics, uh, it doesn't kill it. And these guys start taking over and running problems. So I have a friend, Dr. Horst Filzer. He runs a – he's the guy that put the first stent in the body. Uh, so Harvard medical surgeon, amazing guy. Um, he has a wound healing clinic in Boulder City, uh, Nevada. And he said, you know, it's interesting. He says – we're looking at how to deal with bacteria infection. He goes, half the people that die from surgeries aren't aren't from the surgery. They die from bacteria infections. So he says, our biggest threat now is bacteria infection. So inside our body, our biggest threat to our digestive health in, in our intestinal tract is these bad bacteria that can cause problems or opportunists. What I say by opportunist is, let's say you travel to a foreign country and you start eating some food or getting exposed to some products that you haven't normally have and you start getting you know, stomach aches or you're getting problems or you get vomiting or you get a fever or you get all these issues. Well, it's because now the, the, the dietary habits there or the bacteria you're taking in there, your body doesn't know how to respond to and that creates a growth and a proliferation of these other guys which throws off what's called the microbiome, that, that total, that 10, 80, 10, those 500 guys are called the microbiome, that this is the the garden inside your body that performs functions. It's also responsible for your immune system. These bacteria will fight off other pathogens. They'll take out other bacteria in a healthy system. But when we're taking a lot of antibiotics, what happens? Antibiotics are, are like dropping a bomb inside there. It kills the good. It kills the bad. It kills the ugly. It kills all of them. And for people who have used a lot of antibiotics for various reasons and, and for good reason, what often doesn't happen is they don't have a program to recondition their bacteria cultures, their good bacteria cultures inside their intestinal tract. And what happens, they get on the merry-go-round, they get sick easier, they have to go back and get on antibiotics. And we see people that have been suffering for years and years and years and years of going in and out of hospitals, getting various antibiotics for various treatments. They're taking proton pumps for digestion. They're taking antiacid pads. They're taking Tums. Um, they're having indigestion. They're having bloating. They're not fitting in their pants. Uh, properly, they, they feel that their brain is fogged, they're tired all the time, and all these symptoms are traced back simply to their digestion system isn't working properly, and there's a simple and easy way to correct this digestive system, and it's not being taught to people, and people aren't don't recognize that it takes, you know, it takes probably 90 days of consistent effort to really get this back, and what it does is the brain comes back online, their digestion comes back online, their stomach starts to go down, they stop having the symptoms that they were experiencing, they feel better, and their dietary habits start to change. Because what's interesting about these bacteria, when you have bad bacteria on your system, they hook into the nervous system and they start telling your brain to eat ice cream and dill pickles at 2 o'clock in the morning when you know you shouldn't because mm -hmm. these guys want to get fed. And oh, yeah. I always say the bugs start running our brains. And now they've actually demonstrated how and, – and, and the science on this is exploding – of how these bacteria are critical to how we think, how we feel, moods, brain chemistry are all related to the bacteria inside our stomach. And wow. I noticed this for years training people.
I would see this. I would coach these people. I'd put them on the program, and, and their moods would change. Their energy would change. Their brain thinking would change. Their feelings would change. Their skin would change. But we didn't know exactly what was the reason. Now science is actually saying, hey, you know what? This does – uh, this is effective, and I think over the next five, ten years, we're going to see some massive breakthroughs, which is exciting. I think that's pretty amazing that it changes moods, that the that the bacteria in your gut can actually affect your attitude, your mood, your thinking. I, I know, and I've known this for quite a while, that the bacteria can affect your cravings, such as candida craving sugar, and people's will throw up their hands and say, I don't know why I have these crazy cravings for sugar. I have a sweet tooth. I just can't help it, blah, blah, blah. And that's that's the, the bacteria craving that sort of food, calling for it because that's what it eats. And to go back to the antibiotics, people know what antibiotics do, and most people anyways. They, they kill the bacteria, and they also know that after you've taken antibiotics, you should have some sort of um, bacterial infusion prebiotics, probiotics, whatever it is into your body, so they'll eat a cup of yogurt or two. And and what I'm hearing from you is that's not nearly sufficient. So what does it take to get your cultures back in balance after uh, a week or more of taking antibiotics? Yeah, and, and I want to be clear here. I'm, I'm certainly not telling people not to take antibiotics. When they, t when they need them and your doctor prescribes them, take them fully, yeah. take them to the end, and complete that – that's very important to complete the cycle because if you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to create mutated bacteria in your own intestinal tract, which are going to be even more difficult the next time the conditions uh, aren't supportive of you, uh, of your health. So what they need to do is, number one, they need to look at their diet. And I think following a, um, a, a, a treatment of antibiotics, you really, really want to be – uh, sharp on your diet. I would definitely in increase your water intake. That's number one. And that sounds boring, but it's really important because you want to flush that stuff out of your system. Number two, I would be suggesting experimenting with various fermented foods, sauerkraut, kimchi, uh, miso, whichever ones that you feel attracted to. Find those different um, – we talk about it on our website. I'll tell people about that later. Different fermented foods that might be right for you. And if you do make yogurts or you're into yogurts, uh, what I would suggest is make your own because most of the yogurts at the, at the shelf level, they're filled with preservatives. You don't know what count of bacteria is inside them. Oftentimes, there's no bacteria inside them. Um, there's often weird preservatives and chemical additives. To, so it, it's, it's not going to do thing. If you look at the original research on uh, probiotics with um, – I guess it was Bulgarian peasants that lived a really long time. They would make this uh, uh, bulg, and that's why they called it uh, El Bulgaricus, was this was this bacteria strain. They would ferment this kefir, and they would have it in the morning, and they'd have a little bit in the afternoon, and they'd have a little bit of an evening. They were reconditioning their bacteria cultures, and they had a population average of living between 90 and 105 years old, or something like this. That's, that's what wow. the original research was. Now, um, for our modern world, we want to start eating that, or you want to start supplementing which is the easy way to do it, of taking some probiotics uh, on a daily basis. One is a preventative measure. And if you do in one of those situations, you want to go on a high dosage. And I have found, and this is my personal experience over the last 15 years working with now it's over 15,000 clients, it really takes about 90 days uh, for most people to really get their bacteria culture and their their digestive system in an optimal level. So I, re I suggest taking higher dosages for at least 30 days, but if you can, for 90 days, and that's like morning and night uh, dosages periodically until you see relief of whatever symptoms that you might be having because a lot of people will come off antibiotics and they, they feel stomach problems or they have gas or they have bloating or acid reflux. Well, what, all that's telling you is that your microbiome is off and you need to put more good guys in there so that you can win the uh, the digestive war that's going on inside your stomach. Now, I've, I've spoken with somebody who did exactly what you said and they they told me that they had pretty much diarrhea, maybe not explosive or really bad but very very loose stools is is that uh, common good question um i have categorized pretty much what tends to happen for people when they go through a a large uh, or what i call therapeutic dosages of bacteria now the first two weeks of that process uh you will have 
it's quite likely that you will have a different relationship with your toilet, <laughs> particularly <laughs> particular if you've had digestive issues or you've suffered from bloating or you have a lot of buildup of what's called mucoid plaque inside the body. You'll start going to the washroom a, a lot. And, and, and for a lot of people, this is very strange. They're going, where is this stuff going coming from? I'll give you an example. When I started, I went on a 10-day fast. I didn't eat any food for 10 days. And I was taking massive amounts of, of enzymes and probiotics a day. I was taking 25 enzymes per day and 12 probiotics per day um, during this time. On day 10, I'm still doing number twos. Like Where did it come from? Four times a day. You're kidding me. Day 10, you're not eating anything for 10 days and you're... I'm still getting stuff out of your system because what most people don't realize is this undigested food packs down and compresses and then mm -hmm. packs down and compresses and packs down and compresses. And there's bacteria cultures in different one, different parts of these layers that come up. And when as you're going through the detoxification place, sometimes you'll activate an area that hasn't been exposed for a long period of time. And so you, the first couple of weeks can be – uh, enlightening. It can be challenging. You can make, go through a variety of systems. You got to kind of just stick through it. And, and one of the reasons why I suggest a lot of water, and if you can add minerals to that, that's really great because when you drink a lot of water or you start flushing the system, oftentimes people can, you know, suffer from mineral deficiencies and stuff like that. But stick with it. And then usually by two to four weeks, they start feeling better and they start noticing, okay, I'm starting to get things are starting to make more sense. Um, what I find by that time is a lot of times various symptoms will start to change or diminish. And usually by the second month, there's a definite notice of uh, less sleep requirement, uh, improved vitality when one wakes up in the morning, better concentration capacity. And oftentimes there is a significant changes in appetite. Uh, and sometimes that'll be an increase in appetite because you're looking for key nutrients. It might seem a change for the kind of foods that you want or the foods that you don't like. All of a sudden, that your favorite dish doesn't taste any good, any, doesn't taste good anymore, and that's largely because you, you're starting to take out those bacteria that are causing those cravings. And all of a sudden, you start being attracted to foods that you never thought. I, you know, I really feel like a salad today. And you're like, I, when's the last time I've had that? And I've seen this over and over and over. And then by the third month, if you continue on this process. What tends to happen is people start to see, wow, I, I, my skin is better. My eyes or people are asking me, what, what are you doing different? There's a glow to the body. Um, there is a clarity. Also, one feels kind of buoyant and confident. You're not affected by other people who have you know, maybe allergies or illnesses or sickness or whatever. You're not, you don't have fears about it. And people really start to feel different. Plus, Bloating goes down. Usually by that time, people have almost without exception will lose somewhere between five and ten pounds in their body. And I'm not saying that's fat. I, I think a lot of it's just built up goop. <laughs> for, that, there's a scientific word for you. Built up goop in the body that is now out of the system. So you feel lighter. Your pants feel better. Uh, these type of things, you fit in your clothes better. And, uh, you know, you don't have the muffin top or the pooch or the beer belly hanging out. Right. And that's really, really uh, exciting for people. And it's just easier to stay on uh, whatever dietary program they're following. You spoke about uh, poor quality foods. And I, I think it's pretty safe to assume that fast food, burgers, fries, deep fried foods are on that list of poor quality foods. So what would a person eat? Let's say a person goes, wants to turn their, their um, gut biome around. Let's say they didn't want to fast for 10 days, but they started taking probiotics, eating fiber, um, um, fermented foods and drinks such as kombucha and that sort of thing. What sort of diet would they eat? What sorts of foods would they eat or not eat to help contribute to maintaining a healthy gut? Well, that's an awesome question. And uh, I don't know if we will be able to cover all of it, but I'll give some resources at the end of this that we can go, go into where people can go into that. Number one, you want to choose whole natural foods. That's the first and foremost thing. If you can afford and purchase organic, please do so because what most people don't know is on foods that have herbicides, pesticides, and fungicides, which is most conventionally grown foods, um, 
how they work is they interrupt the enzymatic activity inside the body that's or inside the bugs and kills them that way. So how much of that do you need to do? Um, so if you can eat that uh, whole natural foods, start in the morning. I always love if a uh, blood sugar issue isn't a big one. I, I love a smoothie. Uh, if you can start with a smoothie, that's great. It's light. Uh, if you can use plant-based uh, proteins, I think that's superior, particularly with lots of fiber. I like um, to add hemp into it with various fruits, and uh, if you like it cold, you can use frozen fruits and that sort of things. If you don't, if you're not, if you're sensitive to fruits, you might have a more vegetable-oriented one. Uh, so just blend all that stuff in a blender. You get lots of nutrients. Take some enzymes with it to, so that it digests very well. Uh, add some. Uh, some really good fats or take a little bit of essential fatty acids or you can get Udo's uh, oil or or you can take hemp oil or one of those whole natural oils I think are really great. Some If you don't like oils, you can add, take a few caps of that. Start that day with a nutrient-dense shake. Second meal, um, I, I would – if I always have what I call a rainbow salad. Mm, and, yum. And, and, and that was developed by a famous fellow, Bernard Jensen, uh, who also ended up uh, – Discovering the power of enzymes and probi- probiotics at 85 years old. Dr. O'Brien actually worked on him. You can read his book on Come Alive and what happened to him. That was an amazing story because um, he, he missed the point. But a long story short, um, having that rainbow salad, a salad that has lots of colors in it. So I, 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 I travel a lot and I always end up going to Whole Foods salad bars <laughs> everywhere I go it seems. Yep. And I go in there and I build a giant salad with all these different colors and different foods and different things. And, I, and without a doubt, every time I go to the counter – Somebody comments and says, wow, wait, that's an amazing salad. Are you going to eat all that? And I go, yeah, because there's not a lot of calories in it, but there's an amazing amount of phytonutrients and prebiotics and fiber that allows your, your those good bacteria to feed on that and to live and to also accelerate the elimination. Lots of fiber will help move the body, and you do need to drink lots of water. And then in the evening, I just say, eat a, a meal that you like. So – you don't have to go crazy. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have everything. But in that morning, have that big smoothie. In the afternoon, have a, a, a salad, a big salad. You can add a protein to it that you like or whatever. Try and keep the carbohydrates down. Or if you do use carbohydrate, use straight you know, natural foods. You can use rice or potatoes or whatever it is that you like as a carbohydrate. Uh, fruits if you like uh, – if you want to go low, like, low, low glycemic. And then in the evening, have an ordinary meal. Now, in between, uh, if you have – Snacks, I use low glycemic fruits and vegetables and nuts, and not too much, but a little bit. So you can eat. You'll never get fat on carrots or celery or apples. You can eat those things all day long. But, but carrots are high in sugar. Yeah, I, I always love that one. It's like uh, some of these things. When you look at the uh, the GI track, when they talk about glycemic index and stuff, um, first off, those are controlled conditions. I don't think there's anybody in the world that can get fat on a dietary habits of carrots. Likewise, if you look at glycemic, ice cream is low glycemic because of the fat slow down the digestion. But I can tell you for a fact you can get fat on ice cream. I, so, I've witnessed that myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. as we all have. I mean, who doesn't love ice cream? But anyways, um, the reality is, is I think a lot of people get analysis paralysis, plain whole foods, Smoothie in the morning, salad in the afternoon, uh, a, a dinner that you enjoy in the evening, and uh, just just have those snacks around that right for your body. And some people are going to respond to different types, so there's no absolutes here. You've got to kind of dial things in for yourself and take those enzymes before every meal and then take some probiotics um, in the mornings and in the evenings, and, and you're going to be in great shape in 90 days. I can tell you that. It's great stuff, Wade. Really great. Is um, there a way that somebody could? Uh, do you have a website that people could view and maybe get a um, some written guidance on this? I'm of course going to have show notes at livefitpodcast.com for this episode, and they'll uh, I'll have a link there. But uh, tell us what they'll find when they get to your site. Oh, great. Um, thank you for sharing this because uh, I'm on a mission to help as many people as possible, and uh, I've created a complete 12 week course. Uh, so it's it's the whole 90 days that people can download for free. This is going to be a free value. I, I was instructed to charge thousands of dollars for it, but I said, you know what? I want to contribute to mankind. I want to contribute to their health. I want to have a simple and easy format for everybody. It's a series of videos that explains all the different possible things that you could do to improve your health. I call it the awesome health course. 
Nice. Uh, and uh, and it's gonna it's free to all your listeners. So awesomehealthcourse.com slash live fit. And that's it. You click on that link, and what it's going to do, it's going to take you through what I call the awesome health formula for health. And uh, I'll if I can share with your listeners, I'll give you the abbreviations. Yep. Awesome is an acronym. It stands for air, water, exercise, sunlight. Optimizers, and these are the things that people looking for nutritional supplements, what optimizes cellular function, and then mental beliefs and attitudes, and then finally, education, testing, and coaching, etc. And these nice. things comprise the entire formula. And I'm going to take people through that are listening in the awesomehealthcourse.com slash live fit or live fit. And what they're going to do is they're going to be able to select these. They're, most of the videos are between 5 and 15 minutes on the long side. There's a couple longer ones, but most are 5 and 15 minutes. And they can just take a course a day. They don't have to apply everything, but they are going to learn about – I'm going to show them all about digestion. I'm going to show them all about enzymes and probiotics. I'm going to show them all about the different waters and breathing exercises they can do, simple things that are cost-effective that allows them – to experience awesome health, the, the health that they were born with, the health that's inside their DNA, the health that's inside their genetics that is waiting to come out. It's waiting to explode with vibrancy and health. And they can do this by simply following these principles, do the course. And what's great about it is we have thousands and thousands of people around the world that have done this. And they haven't done everything, but they've done some of the course. And virtually all of them report incredible results and uh it's just a, it's our gift to the world and we love doing it so i i just want to turn that over to your listeners and, and help them see that message wade that is awesome and i mean that and i'm gonna i'm gonna try that myself because uh look you can't be too healthy or too rich right <laughs> absolutely <laughs> if i can get at least one of those <laughs> i'll be happy and, and, and i'm the best i really would prefer health good health over over being rich so i i'm i'm gonna follow your course thank you wade it's been such a pleasure speaking with you i i know that this has been really eye-opening to a lot of people uh, especially the brain fog one i know that's not quite a new idea but it's it's one of those things that i think people need to hear a couple of times before they really get it and, and I hope that a few people's light bulbs went on with this and decide to improve their gut health because it really is worth it and it really does matter. You bet. Thanks so much for having me today. It's my pleasure. All right. You have a great one. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Live Fit Podcast. Please subscribe and share with someone you care about. Read show notes, articles, resources, and learn more about our weight management programs at livefitpodcast.com. Once again, thanks for listening and always remember to live fit.